So it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I want to take you with me to um, five years ago when I was lying in bed and I woke up and untangled myself from a mass of mosquito netting, wiped copious sweat off of my face because I was in an incredibly humid environment, and climbed out of bed, walking outside, being careful not to step on any strange or foreign bugs or snakes. And I asked myself, how did a nice doctor like me end up in the jungle of Ecuador? And that brought me back to my reason and my journey from actually being an integrative pediatric neurologist, but finding one day my then seven-year-old son having a seizure on the floor of my bathroom. And obviously, it was terrifying, speaking of PTSD. <laughs> and when he woke up and walked over to me and I held him as tightly as I could, I knew that even though I was probably one of the only integrative pediatric neurologists in the world, I knew about food as medicine, I knew about nutrition, I knew about botanicals, I all, and I thought at that time that I could really help any person. I think I had some hubris at that time, and I maybe, you know, I felt pretty confident, but in that moment I knew with all of my heart that I didn't have the tools to help my son and that I was going to be going on a journey to learn how to help him and other people like him because my practice is actually full of what I call canaries in the coal mine, the people who are extra sensitive. You know, maybe you know someone or you yourself are someone who experiences the world in that extra sensitive way where you feel things that maybe other people don't notice or feel. So, of course, when you set an intention like that, something or someone is going to open up in your life. And in my case, I met uh, a PhD in ethnobotany, who also happened to be a fourth generation shaman from Ecuador, who invited me on a trip to Ecuador to learn more about an incredible cutting edge treatment, which is also really ancient, plant medicine. And although I already knew about herbal medicine, um, and I was using it in my practice and tinctures and, you know, pills and different ways like that, I realized that there was a whole nother level to how plants can heal. And so plants are incredibly special. For those of you who don't have a healing relationship with plants, you don't, you know, go take a little bit of elderberry or echinacea if you feel like you're coming down with something, um, plants are balancing. So most drugs that are out there either push you in one direction or the other, and they kind of force your body to do things that it wouldn't otherwise do. But plants are all about bringing you into balance and helping your body to heal using its own resources. So they don't do it for you necessarily. They stimulate your body to employ its own healing properties. And interestingly, the word drug actually is derived from a word that's to dry because our original drugs were plants, but we've kind of forgotten that, right? And I had to travel all the way to Ecuador and learn from Warani and Quechua people there how we can employ plants and be in relationship with plants for our own healing. So at that time, I was a desperate mom, and I wanted to know how to help to heal my son. And in the process, I learned a lot about healing myself, and about healing my patients. And here I am now talking about how to live till 100. How do we extend our life? And you know, a lot of people might say, well, why would I even want to live till 100? Because you know what? Like, aging is dismal, right? It all goes downhill from here. Why would I even want to? And I think we do. You know, if we think about it, we do want to live for a long time. But we want to do so joyfully and in a robust way and with an incredibly high quality of life. And I think plants really offer that possibility, both by interacting with our physiology and making our bodies healthier and more able to live and survive for a long time, but also in a way so that we can enjoy our lives and feel fantastic. Plants are really special because a lot of people like to think about plants as a particular compound, right? Like scientists especially like to research 
a particular compound in a plant and say, this is what makes you healthy in this plant, or this is what's important about this plant. And that's actually how we've derived a lot of drugs. A lot of pharmaceuticals are actually from the one strong compound in a plant. But the way plants work is that they're a universe. They're as complex as we are. And so that one compound is only a tiny, tiny snapshot of all that that plant can offer. And it's a whole spectrum of different compounds that are weaker, 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 stronger, stronger, stronger. And then there are compounds that actually work against that powerful property. And that's the way that plants have all these incredibly nuanced effects in our body. And we've evolved with plants. So we recognize, our bodies recognize plants, and we interact with them in really special ways. And my teacher from Ecuador actually talks about the fact that when we come into contact with plants, and I'm going to speak about all the ways that we do that, we actually start to produce new compounds in our bodies as, as if we're falling in love. So plants actually create all kinds of new physiology and new possibility in our bodies. Part of the reason for this is that plants actually embody terrain. So our bodies are a certain kind of terrain, right? Our bioterrain. And then we have around us our ecoterrain, which is soil, sun, air, water, seeds, microbes, right? And, and plants embody all of those elements so that we're in contact with all of those elements when we're in contact with plants. And we kind of know this about food, right? We know that with food, we're getting all kinds of benefits, and they affect us on a nutritional level, on a genetic level. We heard earlier about epigenetics, so they affect us in how our genes are read, and they affect us on a metabolic level. <clears throat> But plants also do something else. They enhance our salutogenesis, okay? They make us feel a sense of health and well-being. And we talk about in medicine pathogenesis, which is the process of uh, disease, basically. How does disease happen? So plants actually enhance our process of becoming healthy and feeling good. And plants heal us in a lot of ways. So yes, ingestion, yes, nourishment, but in sensory ways and by connecting us with awe and gratitude, by connecting us with place and nature, and our culture, and other cultures, and also to memories and, and to eternal knowledge. And I'm going to give you an example, because that might sound complex, and how do we do that? But plant healing is one of the most accessible things that you can imagine. Who here has ever um, received or given flowers to somebody? Raise your hand. Okay, so you've participated in plant medicine. Okay, why do we give flowers to people when they're feeling, um, when we love them? Okay, why do we have flowers at weddings or when someone's celebrating, do we send them flowers? Or when they're grieving and when they're sad, right, we send flowers. Because plants change the way we feel. They transform the way we experience the world. Who here likes to go to the forest or to the beach? Okay, this is another way we're experiencing the healing of plants. So in Japan, there's a concept called Shinrin-yoku, and that means literally translated forest bathing. And all that is, is immersing yourself in the beauty of the forest. Well, I don't think most of us really need research to know that that makes us feel better. Uh, I personally try to go running almost every day in the forest because I find it so transformative and healing. But... Because it's a practice in Japan, it's been studied. And so they've found it improves sleep, it improves mood, it improves focus and concentration and learning and executive function. And actually, it enhances your immune system. So it, it boosts your natural killer cells, and actually your body produces more anti-cancer proteins when you've spent time in the forest. Okay? So being in the forest basically makes you live longer and better. What about other ways, like essential oils, right? Smelling plants. Well, that's going to go straight, bypassing any processing systems, go straight to your amygdala, to your primitive brain, and can change your brain in many ways. 
Rosemary essential oil actually was found to improve mood, enhance memory, and even change your EEG tracings. These are the kinds of things that an essential oil can do. Lavender essential oil resulted in people who were feeling happier, fresher, and more relaxed. How's that for enhancing your quality of life? And that's just by enjoying a beautiful smell. Who here loves coffee so much that they would put a heart in their coffee if they could every day? <laughs> so coffee is a, is a plant tonic, okay? It's a bitter tonic. And this bitter tonic that many, many people are consuming every single day has alkaloids, which actually also enhance your brain function, enhance your digestion, are boosting your detoxification and making you feel obviously much better. So uh, many people are employing these kinds of plant medicines every day. Tea as well. So there are studies looking at certain components of tea like L-theanine and caffeine and how those can boost your cognitive performance and your mood and make you feel better. Chamomile tea, right? So tea time, you're having your chamomile tea. It turns out that there are studies on that chamomile that actually show that it's effective at treating generalized anxiety disorder, <coughs> right? So the things that we're bringing into our lives all the time are helping us to heal and helping us to improve our quality of life. But we need to remember that that's our plant medicine. Passion flower. And I feel like, you know, when I have these pictures, it's because I'm introducing you to my friends, right? These plants are really, are really somewhat these creatures, in a sense, or these living beings that we're in relationship with. Passion flower actually has been uh, shown to be as effective as benzodiazepines in treating anxiety. So it's an opportunity to not have to use pharmaceuticals and to benefit instead from experiencing a plant. Reishi mushroom has been looked at for many, many things. There are probably over 5,000 studies on reishi by now, one of which is anti-aging. And then we have these other medicines, right, like um, med medical marijuana. And we're learning now that these plants that we thought might have been dangerous or problematic are actually incredibly helpful. So for things like treatment-resistant epilepsy, I've seen really transformative effects using medical marijuana in patients. Um, chronic pain as well, and anxiety one of the most amazing studies that recently came out in the last weeks is that um, in areas where marijuana has become legalized, death from addiction has dropped by almost 25%. So when we're talking about longevity and quality of life, we really need to open our minds. Um, and this is just a study, just so you know I'm not making it up. <laughs> On, on the way that cannabis can help intractable chronic pain. Um, magic mushrooms. So psilocybin has now been studied for cluster headaches, for OCD, for PTSD, right? And in fact, for substance use disorder, so for addiction. Um, and it's being shown, you know, now in academic trials to be very effective for that. And ayahuasca, which is a, a vine that grows in South America, is now being used in a lot of different studies um, and by a lot of people to treat PTSD, to treat, uh, well, a lot of different conditions. It's called, I think, 10 years of therapy in five hours. So it may not be fun, <laughs> but in one single dose of ayahuasca, there have been found to be antidepressant effects for people who have treatment-resistant depression that are long-lasting. And it's also effective for PTSD and for uh, trauma. So a lot of people might say plants are dangerous, right? Those kinds of plants are powerful, they're psychoactive. They, you know, what could they do? Like, do we really understand the kind of risk? And so these are... Um, these are all examples of master plants. In indigenous communities, these powerful plants are called master plants. And you see there a picture of tobacco, which is a master plant, and also the coca plant. So the coca plant um, is really uh, a very powerful plant that's used for stimulation. It's used for mental clarity and cognitive enhancement and, and actually for altitude sickness. So everyone chews it 
you know, when you're in Ecuador, Peru, to go up in the mountains. But obviously, the coca plant can also be made into cocaine, and that's an incredibly destructive kind of drug. So how do we, how do we navigate that? So plants, because they're living beings, we have to know they're not here for us to use. They're not things. They are actually allies in our health and longevity, and we're in relationship with them. And so that connection and that sacred relationship and having respect for their power is how we can avoid running into the kinds of problems that we have run into with things like tobacco and with things like the coca plant and with the poppy plant, right? All of these plants that are ma powerful master plants with incredible capacity for healing but also for destruction. So we have to be in sacred relationship. And uh, plants really embody that science and sacred. Um, in Ecuador and Peru, many people will, wear, will use seeds as actually protection. That's part of how plants are used. And this is a way that sort of science and sacred are combined. So these are called wairuro seeds. It took me a long time to learn how to say that. And, um, and you'll see many people wearing these kinds of seeds in, in South America. Um, and plants are used, this is achote, which is also called anato, and that's actually painted on people's faces there to help transform them, to help them feel braver or better or happier or stronger, and it's used for people with depression and um, sometimes like sexual abuse or other kinds of trauma to help them transform. Mm -hmm. Trying to get to the next slide. There we go. So to bring you back to my son, who's almost 12 now, he did not have any more seizures. And we employ plant medicine in our home in a lot of different ways. And um, one of the things that happens when he's not feeling well is he sometimes will choose to burn sage um, to help him feel better and help the space feel better. So he'll sage himself or, or the room. And this has been used for hundreds if not thousands of years as a way, actually literally it does clean the space. Studies have shown that it kills certain kinds of microbes in the air for up to 24 hours. But also, it clears the space and makes it feel better. And so I wanna light it right now. I have permission to do this, but... Um, <laughs> I didn't light it too much. Um, and this is to help this space feel better, but also um, to help open our minds and clear, and clear out all of our blocks so that we can be open to all the possibilities of plants and what they have to offer us and all of the ideas that are being brought out today so that we can be open to all the doors that can open for us um, because there are incredible... Um, there's incredible potential when we shift our paradigm. And um, this is a book that I wrote, The Dirt Cure, and it's my website. So if anyone wants to communicate with me or, or learn more about what I teach, um, you can just find me there, and I'm happy to send you slides if you want them. And uh, I just want to close with this idea of we're not looking for anything new. This is ancient but um, sometimes we just have to open our eyes differently. Thank you very much.